Welcome to Financial Decisions in Markets, a course in asset pricing. I'm John Campbell, the author of the book from Harvard Economics Department, and I'd like to offer you this video introduction uh, to the book. So what is Financial Decisions in Markets? It grows out of a PhD asset pricing course I've taught at Harvard since 1994, and I taught a similar prior course at Princeton for 10 years uh, before that. The Harvard uh, teaching context has several distinguishing features that have influenced the book. Uh, first of all, the students taking the course are students in an economics PhD program, not a finance PhD program, so I have to sell the field of finance and locate it within the broader discipline of economics. The students have already taken first year PhD microeconomics, macroeconomics and econometrics, so I can assume some of that background. Uh, but at Harvard, we have no separate courses in theoretical and empirical asset pricing, so I uh, attempt to integrate those two aspects of the field in a single presentation. I've been very impressed over the years with the quality of the students that uh, it's been my privilege to teach, and I've benefited also from an amazing sequence of uh, teaching fellows, TFs as we call them at Harvard, uh, who have had a significant influence on the book as it's developed. Finally, of course, because this is a, a, an economics program, the students are particularly interested in the connections between finance and other fields, and so I attempt to draw some of those connections uh, in this book. Now, of course, uh, there are many other books on finance uh, that you could regard as competition, and indeed, uh, my book uh, from 20 years ago with uh, Andrew Lowe and Craig McKinley, The Econometrics of Financial Markets, uh, was also uh, written for graduate students and had a somewhat similar style. Um, now, we were very proud of uh, the market for that book. We sold over 40,000 copies. Uh, but the econometrics of financial markets at this point is looking outdated after 20 years. And so I thought it was a good time to once again uh, attempt to review the field. Uh, in this new book, uh, there's more empirical evidence. There's... Um, um, there's, 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 there's more theory, um, whereas uh, Campbell, Lowe, and McKinley did focus on empirical methods and econometrics. Of course, a leading book that I greatly admire is John Cochrane's book, Asset Pricing, uh, the revised edition from 2005. Um, this book has a very clear focus. It uses the stochastic discount factor analysis uh, from the beginning to the end and takes very much a top-down uh, general equilibrium approach uh, without, for example, covering portfolio choice theory. Uh, the book has relatively little on models with heterogeneous agents, doesn't really talk about behavioral finance, and while it does present empirical results, these are left to the end of the book rather than being integrated with the rest of the material. Now, of course, there are many other books uh, as well, and uh, I've put on the slide here a distinguished list of books that present asset pricing theory, but without much attention to uh, empirical evidence. Um, and finally, I'll mention uh, two books that are a little bit more like Campbell, Lowe, and McKinley, uh, one, one by uh, Kenneth Singleton and one recent book by Barley, Engel, and Murray. So there are many books to choose from, but I'll try to um, explain in this video some of the unique features of this particular uh, book. Well, um, throughout the book, I try to follow certain pedagogical principles. And uh, here's a list of them. First of all, uh, I believe finance theory today is quantitative. Uh, we've moved well beyond qualitative models. A lot of the uh, research interest is in the magnitudes of effects, the values of parameters, and so forth. So for this reason, the book emphasizes the interplay of theory and empirical work. A second principle is, uh, I believe that to understand financial markets fully, one must be able to take the perspective of price-taking investors who live in the market and uh, optimize taking prices as given, as well as uh, the perspective of uh, a macroeconomist or equilibrium uh, modeler who's looking at the system from outside. So, I th uh, so the book includes both portfolio choice theory as well as the macro general equilibrium perspective and this is the reason for the title of the book, Financial Decisions and Markets. A third principle that guides the book is that I believe that not all investors are rational optimizers, uh, 
but certainly some are, and the rational perspective is always a, ration, a valuable benchmark. And so for this reason, the book is neither um, an anti-behavioral finance book nor a behavioral finance book. It uh, often takes the viewpoint of a rational investor, even if we consider the possibility that many investors are not fully rational. Now, related to that, I believe that finance theory has normative implications and can be used to deliver investment advice to uh, market participants who may not uh, initially know how to uh, pick an efficient portfolio. And that's a theme that is uh, developed uh, in several places in the book. And finally, uh, I believe that resource allocation matters for the economy just as much as prices. So although the, sub the field is called asset pricing, we want to know what the allocations are. We want to know about quantities as well as prices. And of course, this becomes very relevant when we think about the heterogeneity of investors and the way in which they exchange risks with one another. Now, uh, while the book is, is uh, broadly comprehensive, it does have some limitations. And uh, the major limitation in scope is that it doesn't develop any continuous time methods. So, for example, it doesn't cover derivatives or any securities with embedded optionality, such as risky corporate debt. Um, that made it possible to write a book of, uh, you know, 450 pages as opposed to, say, twice that. Uh, but it is certainly a limitation of scope. I must also admit that despite spending the summer of 2017 carefully proofreading the book, uh, in the first printing there are over 30 known typos. I've discovered that typos are like cockroaches, numerous and hard to kill. Uh, fortunately, uh, the ones I've found have little potential to cause confusion. I maintain an updated log of these typos on my website, and Princeton University Press, the publisher, will uh, correct the typos in the online edition and in future printings of the physical book itself. Finally, let me show you an image of the cover of the book, uh, which uh, is certainly striking red color uh, with a strange arrangement of dots on it. Um, I think you could uh, interpret these dots uh, as a kind of Rorschach test and ask what you see here. Well, you might see uh, randomness with some subtle structure in it. Uh, you might see a scatter diagram with cross-sectionally correlated observations uh, of the type that is shown in the book. Or my favorite interpretation is you might think of this as the way the galaxy looks just before the starship goes to hyperspeed. And uh, perhaps if you open the book, you'll find yourself traveling at hyperspeed. So with that introduction, in the rest of this uh, video, I'd like to go through the structure of the book, explain the content, uh, the table of contents. I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about pedagogical methods that I follow to apply the principles I already discussed. I'd like to take a deep dive into one of the chapters that, that is perhaps more original for a book like this, uh, chapter 11 on risk sharing and speculation, and then finally a very brief summary of the content. So moving on to the structure of the book, uh, it has three broad parts. Uh, part one is on static portfolio choice and asset pricing, which is about 30% of the content. Part two moves from static models to dynamic models and uh, talks about intertemporal portfolio choice and asset pricing. That's 45% of the book. And then part three on heterogeneous investors is 25% of the book. So what's in part one? Well, I follow a fairly conventional exposition, beginning with the, the theory of choice under uncertainty in chapter one. This is really a review chapter. I go quite quickly um, covering basics such as uh, expected utility theory, uh, the definition and measurement of risk aversion, examples of tractable utility functions, uh, critiques of expected utility theory by uh, behavioral economists and others, uh, and finally, uh, procedures for comparing risky distributions. Chapter two begins the real content of this book by talking about static portfolio choice theory. And the chapter is divided into two large sections, the first on how much risk you should take, the choice of risk exposure, and the second part on how you might combine risky assets uh, 
Uh, I go all the way back to the classic mean variance analysis uh, of Markowitz in the 1950s, which of course launched the modern era in uh, financial economics. In chapter three, I turn to static equilibrium models of asset pricing, uh, beginning with the capital asset pricing model. Uh, I talk about uh, arbitrage pricing theory and multi-factor models. And this chapter also contains uh, quite a bit of uh, empirical material. I try to summarize the empirical evidence on the performance of these uh, workhorse uh, models in asset pricing. Finally, chapter four on the stochastic discount factor revisits all of this material using the contemporary uh, SDF paradigm, uh, beginning with a simple ex exposition of a discrete state uh, model with complete markets, the generalization to incomplete markets, discussion of properties of the SDF, volatility bounds, uh, and so forth, and then finally an exposition of generalized method of moments, which of course is so closely linked uh, to this theory of the stochastic discount factor. So that's part one. Uh, what about part two? Well, uh, part two, um, uh, I, I'll show on two slides here. We begin in chapter five by talking about present value relations. So in a simple static model, um, prices are just uh, uh, discounted payoffs um, over one period. And the re really the only question is how discount rates are set. Of course, uh, in a multi-period model, the returns in any period depend on the price that's set in the next period as well as the price that's set today. And so one really has to think in more detail about uh, how discounting is done. So this chapter covers uh, a number of important topics, uh, beginning with uh, market efficiency, um, going back to the classic early work of Gene Farmer, talk about present value models with constant and time varying discount rates, uh, including um, the Gordon Growth Model, linearity generating processes, the Campbell-Shiller log linear approximate model. And then all of this is applied to uh, the history of US stock returns, the literature on uh, predicting uh, returns with regressions. Um, and then I talk about uh, so-called drifting steady state models, which apply Gordon Growth Model logic to uh, equity evaluation in a, in a uh, stochastic economy. And then finally, some, uh, uh, some work on the application of present value logic to the cross-section of stock returns. After that, chapter six covers consumption-based asset pricing. This is a very long chapter since it's a huge literature. I begin with the classic model of log normal consumption growth with power utility. I use that to state three puzzles, the equity premium puzzle, the risk-free rate puzzle, and the equity volatility puzzle. And then I go through various paradigms that have been proposed to resolve these puzzles. Uh, the rare disasters literature, which considers non-log normality in consumption growth. The literature um, on uh, generalizing power utility preferences to allow a distinction between risk aversion and intertemporal substitution. These are the Epstein-Zinn preferences. I talk about the large empirical literature on long-run risk models, which apply Epstein-Zinn preferences. Um, I talk about ambiguity aversion, which can be regarded as an alternative micro foundation for those preferences. I talk about models with habit formation. Uh, and finally, I talk about models in which uh, there are multiple components of consumption, durable and non-durable and utility may be non-separable across those two components. Chapter seven is a relatively short chapter on uh, the literature on production-based asset pricing, which asks um, how one can use the first order conditions of firms that supply capital to the market uh, to tell us something about discount rates. So I uh, begin with the classic literature on Q theory. I review um, general equilibrium models with production and how asset pricing can be done in that context. And finally, I talk about um, the question of whether firm's investment decisions can be used to reveal the marginal rate of transformation across states and hence tell us something about the stochastic discount factor. Moving on, still in part two, chapter eight covers fixed income securities. Uh, beginning with basic concepts such as yields to maturity, forward rates, holding period returns, and so forth. I talk about the expectations hypothesis of the term structure, 
affine term structure models. And then I try to relate those models to uh, macroeconomic, macroeconomic equilibrium, talking about bond pricing in relation to the dynamics of consumption growth and inflation. And finally, there's a short section on interest rates and uh, foreign exchange rates. The last chapter of this section, uh, chapter nine, is on intertemporal models of risk. I talk about, uh, first of all, about long-term portfolio choice. I review the special cases in which long-term portfolio choice is myopic. That's to say the same as static portfolio choice. I talk about the more interesting models in which uh, long-term investors engage in intertemporal hedging. And then I switch to uh, an asset pricing general equilibrium perspective, talk about the intertemporal CAPM, uh, and then recent literature on the term structure of risky assets. And finally, I review learning about uh, parameter values and how that can alter the intertemporal assessment of risk. The final part of the book, part three, is on heterogeneous investors. Chapter 10 begins by summarizing the large and relatively new literature on household finance, um, where we're looking at the decisions of ordinary households in financial markets, and we're looking at some of the special features of their optimization problems that may then influence asset pricing. So this chapter begins by talking about labor income and how that may alter portfolio choice. I then talk about the evidence that many households don't take any risk at all. They don't participate in risky asset markets. I talk about explanations for that and uh, how that might influence asset prices. There's a similar section on under diversification, um, a section on various ways in which households do or do not respond to changing market conditions. I talk about inertia, the disposition effect and so forth. And then finally, there's a brief, uh, very brief section on consumer financial protection. After that, chapter 11 talks about risk sharing and speculation. And the focus here really is on uh, the ways in which allocations fail to perfectly share risk, the reasons why that might be, which include incomplete markets, private information, the possibility that agents can default, and the possibility that agents have heterogeneous beliefs and speculate against one another. So later in this video, I'm going to go through that chapter in greater detail. Finally, chapter 12 uh, talks about models of asymmetric information uh, and, and the very important concept of liquidity. So I begin by reviewing the literature on rational expectations equilibrium in which investors learn from prices. They learn, they learn about other people's information from what they see in asset prices. I talk about market microstructure, the literature on the determination of trading costs. And finally, I review the literature on liquidity and how that uh, influences asset prices and also what may be determining liquidity. So that's the content of the book. Uh, what are the methods that I use to present this content? Uh, this content? Well, um, here, here are some important uh, features of the book. First, uh, when I teach, I always encourage students to ask questions. And I try to repeat this process uh, even in the book. Um, the first uh, way to do that is to pose informal questions verbally in the text. And I answer these at the back of chapters, but it does give readers an opportunity to engage with the material actively. There are also 41 formal problems at the end of the chapters. And there's a separate solution manual, which I've been preparing with uh, uh, my uh, collaborator, our yearist, Ciaris, and that will be available uh, early in the new year from Princeton University Press. A second uh, pedagogical method is that I emphasize analytical solutions of simple models. Um, I feel that for students first approaching this material, it's important to uh, look at analytical solutions and, and develop in economic intuition by uh, discussing their properties. I show how one can use tricks to make models analytically solvable, uh, for example, log linearization, or for another example, assuming normal distributions in combination with constant absolute risk averse utility. Many of these analytically solvable models are now quite old. Um, but I believe they're still highly empirically relevant and important for students to learn. So uh, classic models like Harrison and Krebs from the late 70s, uh, 
or Gloucester and Milgram or, or Kyle from the mid-1980s, these models are still relevant and uh, I give them prominent uh, positioning in the book. Another pedagogical decision I had to make was what to do about notation, and I've tried to unify notation within a particular literature, although not necessarily across literatures. Um, so, for example, uh, papers on rational expectations equilibrium, including uh, Grossman 1976, Grossman Stiglitz 1980, Diamond Varekia 1981, these classic papers are much easier to learn if one converts them into a common notation. So I've done that as part of my work for the book. Now, there are some important themes that I try to develop across chapters to give the book a kind of deeper unity. Um, so, for example, uh, in chapter one, I introduced Jensen's inequality, and I, I joke that uh, the field of finance might be called the economics of Jensen's inequality. Then that's applied later in the book to the mean of the log normal distribution, which is so important in portfolio choice and asset pricing, affine term structure models. Um, I introduce the concept of entropy, which is closely related. That then gets applied to the stochastic discount factor, to ambiguity aversion, to the relation between uh, asset prices and uh, the volatility of payoffs, and so forth. This, this theme of Jensen's inequality is uh, everywhere in the book and is, is a unifying uh, theme. A second unifying theme is, is log utility, the growth optimal portfolio, which is chosen by a log utility investor. That has a very important role in, in stochastic discount factor analysis in chapter four. It's important for intertemporal hedging in uh, chapter nine, for the dynamics of wealth over time, which uh, is discussed in, in chapter 10, and so forth. Now, um, I also, uh, illustrate theories with empirical examples. And this is a, just a very characteristic feature of the book. So I'm going to show that to you now in some figures. Uh, first of all, showing how beta pricing can be related to portfolio choice. Secondly, um, showing how the price to smoothed earnings ratio can be used to uh, predict stock returns. And then finally, the empirics uh, of uh, household under diversification relative to the benchmark of the CAPM. Uh, and so I'm going to show you these figures just to illustrate the way in which theory can be brought alive using empirical examples. So figure 3.2 um, uh, from chapter 3 on, on, on static uh, asset pricing models um, is a, a summary of uh, decisions made over the last uh, 25 years or so by the Harvard University Endowment. And uh, as part of its investing process, Harvard sets a so-called policy portfolio, uh, which has a number of component asset classes. And this figure shows the uh, portfolio weights of different asset classes over time. Now, I've grouped the assets into uh, uh, a group called plain vanilla, which means domestic US stocks and bonds, public stocks and bonds. International is the uh, uh, equivalent of those in other countries. And then exotic asset classes is all the other things, commodities, real estate, uh, alternative investments, and so forth. Now, what you can see is over this period, the plain vanilla share declined, the international share was flat, and the exotic uh, share increased. So the natural question students might have, any anyone might have, is what was responsible for that. And so then the next figure shows a summary of the beliefs that the Harvard endowment managers stated about the means and standard deviations of these asset class returns. The standard deviation is shown on the horizontal axis, the mean return on the vertical axis, as in a classic finance uh, mean standard deviation diagram. And um, the slope of the line from the origin to any point is the sharp ratio of that asset class. The dashed line in the figure is drawn through domestic equity. And you can see that, uh, indeed, um, uh, most asset classes have similar sharp ratios to domestic equity. Um, some, indeed, some of the alternatives, indeed, have lower sharp ratios, such as commodities. So if one were to use the sharp ratio as the measure of attractiveness for an asset class, this figure does not give any reason to think that one should invest more in, uh, in alternatives and move away from domestic uh, equities. However, the point I make in the chapter is that this figure is the wrong figure for thinking about portfolio construction, 
Uh, this figure would only be relevant if one had to choose a single asset class and put the entire endowment in that one asset class. When combining asset classes, what you want to do is look at the betas of the asset classes with uh, an initial portfolio. And this figure 3.4 shows the beta of the asset classes with a portfolio that is 60% domestic equity, 40% domestic bonds. In other words, that's a, a traditional plain vanilla portfolio that's taken as an initial benchmark. And um, uh, the uh, dashed line here is drawn through the 60-40 uh, plain vanilla portfolio. And any asset class that plots above that line has a positive alpha with respect to that portfolio and can be used to improve the Sharpe ratio of the portfolio by adding at least a little bit of that asset class. When one looks at this figure, one can see that the uh, the exotic asset classes such as real estate, natural resources, commodities, absolute return, high yield bonds, and so forth, all have uh, positive alphas. And this helps to explain why Harvard invested the way it did. So that's a first illustration, literally in a set of three figures, of how empirics can bring theory and, uh, alive. Here is another illustration. This is the history of the price to smoothed earnings ratio, or CAPE ratio, which Bob Schiller and I um, popularized in work in the 1980s. And you can see the history of this ratio um, since the late 19th century, uh, with its peaks in years like 1929 and the year 2000. Um, the uh, interesting question is whether this ratio predicts returns, and I show that in figure 5.4, return predictability from the price to smoothed earnings ratio. The black line here, the solid line, is the log of the ratio shown before, and the dashed line is the future 10-year real return. The negative relationship between these two lines throughout the 20th century is very clearly visible. And in chapter five, I discuss both the empirical evidence on this and also some of the theories that have been suggested to explain it. Finally, uh, one last uh, empirical illustration, uh, this one from chapter 10. Uh, this is talking about household uh, uh, portfolio construction and the evidence on diversification. Now, um, the the, the, the diagram here is constructed as a, as a mean standard deviation diagram of the familiar type. And um, it is assumed that a world version of the CAPM holds so that the best one can do is achieve uh, one of those solid lines in the top left of the figure, which go through a world index. There's two v variants of the CAPM, one in which the world index is currency hedged. That's the uh, diamond, the upper line and the other in which the world index is unhedged, that that's the lower line through the circle. The dots here don't represent individual stocks, they re represent individual portfolios. In the top panel of the figure, these are directly held stock portfolios. Um, and one can see uh, that um, most of these portfolios held by Swedish households are really quite inefficient. One can, in fact, see uh, in the top right of the cloud of points, a, uh, a hyperbola, which is formed from the very popular two stock portfolios consisting of, of two particularly popular US uh, Swedish stocks that many Swedes uh, held at the time of this study. Um, the bottom panel of the figure shows what happens when one takes account of mutual fund holdings. And these make the picture look much better because essentially mutual funds are well diversified. Many Swedes hold them and they come very close to the, um, uh, the efficient line defined by the unhedged world index. Uh, however, you can see that there still are some Swedish households who are very highly undiversified and, and investing relatively inefficiently. So I think this figure uh, is a way to show how um, when we go to micro data, we can relate the things that households actually do, the portfolios they hold. We can relate those to the predictions of simple theories, and we can begin to understand what's going on and how this may influence uh, allocations of wealth over time across households. So um, following from that, I'd, I'd like to take a deep dive into one of the chapters, chapter 11,
uh, on risk sharing and speculation. And I've chosen this chapter because I think it illustrates the novelty of this book. The chapter discusses the allocations and welfare that result from limited risk sharing, not just the implications for asset prices. It presents a taxonomy of reasons for limited risk sharing, and it includes a behavioral literature on speculation among agents with heterogeneous beliefs. And all of this work connects very well with other parts of economics. Uh, general equilibrium theory, uh, which uh, you know is a less important topic among micro theorists than it used to be, but has been picked up by macro theorists and asset pricing theorists, as shown in this chapter. There's the, the literature on the new dynamic public finance, which is very related to this, and of course, macroeconomics. So what are these reasons for limited risk sharing? Some of them were actually discussed in earlier chapters of the book. Uh, chapter eight mentions that uh, if there are goods in different countries and trade costs between countries, um, then one's really measuring uh, asset prices in different numeraires in different places. Um, and trade, trade costs may simply prevent uh, the, the physical transactions of goods that would be needed to, to share risks. Chapter 10 on household finance talks about the fact that some investors don't take any risk at all. They, they simply don't participate in risky markets. That might result from fixed participation costs. And chapter 10 talks about optimization failures by some investors, notably the under-diversification that we were just looking at. But chapter 11 then brings in some more reasons why limited risk sharing, why risk sharing may be limited. Section 11.1 talks about models in which markets are just incomplete, exogenously incomplete, so not all risks can be traded. Section 11.2 talks about private information. That, of course, relates to the new dynamic public finance. Section 11.3 is on models in which agents can default and walk away from their debts and punishment is imperfect. And section 11.4 brings in the subject of heterogeneous beliefs, where agents speculate against one another rather than sharing their risks. So what about incomplete markets? That's section 11.1. I show how uninsurable income risk can affect asset prices uh, based on the classic work of, of uh, George Constantinides and Daryl Duffy in 1996. I show that this, for this effect to be important, we need randomness in the cross-sectional consumption distribution that goes away in continuous time with diffusions over short intervals of time, and arguably it's small unless there are large jumps in consumption at the micro level. It can, however, be amplified by other frictions such as borrowing constraints or limited participation. After that, I uh, show that with a finite number of markets for sharing risks, it matters which ones you create, and I summarize a paper by Athanasoulis and Schiller, which solves the optimization problem of a social planner who is creating markets subject to a constraint on the number of markets that can be created. And the theme of this work is there's a tension between creating swaps, which enable uh, people to swap their idiosyncratic incomes with each other, versus a claim on a global income index, which can be used to transfer risk from risk averse to risk tolerant agents. Finally, I emphasize the very important point that when you have multiple goods in incomplete markets, competitive equilibrium may not, in fact, be constrained Pareto optimal, a point which goes back to the work of Oliver Hart in the mid-1970s and was generalized by Gina Coplis and Polymancharkis in the 1980s. Now, this is the foundation of a modern macro literature on pecuniary externalities, for example, so-called fire sale externalities, uh, but it's very important in asset pricing as well. Section 11.2 talks about private information and highlights the fact that an inverse Euler equation describes a constrained Pareto optimal allocation. Uh, again, going back to the mid-1980s and the work of Rogerson. Now, the inverse Euler equation shown on this slide is consistent with the regular Euler equation only when risk sharing is perfect. And the reason is that the last term on the right-hand side is the e expectation of a reciprocal of marginal utility that's only the same as the reciprocal of the expectation of marginal utility when there is no, uh, 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 when there is no uh, cross-sectional uh, uncertainty. Uh, so it's an application of Jensen's inequality, and um, it uh, 
it shows the challenges in um, reconciling uh, un un unrestricted trading in financial assets with schemes to um, share risk efficiently in the presence of private information. Uh, I also briefly talk about the work of Kocha Lakota and Pista Ferry um, on uh, constructing a stochastic discount factor to describe an economy in which a social planner is trading assets in order to set up a uh, constrained uh, private information Pareto optimum. The next section talks about default, um, and of course the effect of uh, default depends on how it can be punished, because traders limit the claims they will buy to those they expect to be paid, and their expectations about payment depend on the punishment for non-payment. So I contrast two broad literatures, the first going back to Kehoe and Levine, 1993, where the assumption is that the punishment is future exclusion from financial markets. I present in some detail a paper by Alvarez and Yerman in which markets are otherwise complete, uh, but we have this uh, exclusion punishment for default. Um, Alvarez and Yerman show that this punishment is more effective when agents are more patient, more risk averse, and face greater idiosyncratic risk. What that means is that if idiosyncratic income risk increases, it can actually reduce the uh, the consumption risk, the, 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 the uninsured risk uh, that remains with individual agents, because the increase in idiosyncratic income risk can allow agents to do more risk sharing in equilibrium. Then I contrast that literature with uh, the work of Chien and Lustig and Rampini and Viswanathan, where they assume that default is punished by seizure of collateral. And in models like that, the degree of risk sharing depends on the availability of collateral, uh, notably housing. Uh, and there are many papers on that uh, in the recent literature. Um, I also make the point that in, in these complete market models, um, default tends to occur when income is high. And, um, um, uh, and then the, the claims that have been issued imply negative cash flows, uh, money going out. And of course, this is the opposite of observed bankruptcy, which is a limitation of this class of models. Finally, section 11.4 on heterogeneous beliefs uh, talks about what happens when we relax the assumption of homogeneous and rational expectations. So I talk about behavioral models with noise traders, going back to the work of Schiller uh, in the early 1980s, and in these models, the market portfolio held by rational investors is the residual left over after noise traders have, ha have formed their demands, not the total market portfolio. And um, uh, that, that implies a different type of uh, asset pricing. And of course, it raises the issue of how the wealth of these two groups of traders evolves over time. I also cover the Harrison Kreps 1978 model with heterogeneous beliefs and short sales constraints this is a model in which prices can be higher than the perceived fundamental value of any investor because each investor believes that he or she is trading with uh, irrational investors who can be exploited. Uh, finally, I talk about a recent literature on endogenous margin constraints uh, originated by John Jean Coplas, in which um, agents have heterogeneous beliefs about asset fundamentals and we combine that with collateralized lending between agents. So hopefully that review of chapter 11 gives you an idea of some of the original material that you won't find in other asset pricing books and the way in which this is all connected to other parts of uh, modern economics. So in conclusion, um, I'm delighted to be able to bring Financial Decisions and Markets to market. Uh, it's a book that took five years to write and it took me 35 years to learn the material. Uh, the book has historical depth, uh, as hopefully has become clear in this summary. I go way back as far as the 1950s. There are many sites to older models, but uh, I've tried to bring it very much up to date and uh, cite uh, the latest work. The book also has breadth. There's a wider range of topics than you'll find in previous asset pricing textbooks. So I'm very excited by the opportunity to share this material, not only with my students at Harvard, but with the entire economics profession and those of you who are studying to enter the profession and become financial economists. Thank you. <laughs>